so you call yourself a libertarian. What, what made you decide to be a libertarian? Well, I'd heard the word uh, in 1976 after the Democratic National Convention when Roger McBride, the Libertarian Party candidate, gave a little speech about what libertarianism was. And I thought that was very interesting. And then immediately afterwards, uh, the local news people came on and said, oh, those ideas were great for the 19th century, but they don't make sense for modern complex society. And I thought, well, that's an interesting response. Um, and I was interested when I was in high school with uh, utopian experimentation with different kinds of societies. Because my general, my general belief is that we got to be able to do better than this, and uh, and I you know I, I lived in a society and I thought we got to be able to do better than this, and people should be able to experiment. Well, what kind of things bothered you? Well, I, for one thing, I was it was annoyed by bigotry and the and, and that kind of stuff. I was also very much annoyed by warfare. Um, we had, were going through the Vietnam War when I was a kid, and we'd just gotten out of it when I was starting to think about politics, and. Uh, and I remember hearing about Abraham Lincoln's justification for government. You know, just a, government is there to do what individuals can't do separately. And I immediately thought, well, we can't commit warfare without without the government. We can't commit genocide without government. We can't mass expropriate the Indians without government. We can't mass. We can't put, keep a, a blacks in slavery without government. Yeah, that's a great argument there, Abraham. So I was interested in anarchism. I was actually, frankly, interested in anarchism. Um, and I came across a review in the New York uh, Times uh, by Hillel Steiner of Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And it was a very interesting review, and I read it, and I ordered the book, and I read the book, and I came across some ideas I had never encountered before. <laughs> Nothing like this in my uh, in my little Bailey. Well, you were raised a very Christian mainstream. Was it mainstream Christian? Would you call it evangelical fundamentalist? Christian. And libertarianism doesn't necessarily clash with no, but but I was given the Christian. same. I was given the same uh, education in public school that everybody else is, which is this sort of half-assed patriotism, you know, that, that America is good and anything the American does you know, in the end is a good thing. And, you know, like, I kind of not, you know, I call it politicy. The, it's like theodicy, of, the theodicy of Leibniz was that uh, all is right with the world and, uh, you know, uh, it all works out for the best because this is the best of all possible worlds. I thought that was Voltaire. That's Voltaire had made fun of it. Oh, okay. Voltaire was making oh, fun of right. it. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and he was making fun of Leibniz's theodicy. And I think Americans tend to, tend to have, especially their educational materials, a politicy. Whatever really happened was the best thing to happen at any one time. And I realized... That that idea was obviously untrue, so that mistakes were made throughout human throughout human history and certainly throughout American history, and that one can criticize leaders and that one can, can criticize the ideologies that cooked up. So I was open minded. I didn't have any ideas. I just thought that you know, you have to you have to go with with you know obvious skepticism and a concern for. Not the truth, but also what are the results of policies, and uh, so and I came upon these libertarian ideas in Nozick, and he didn't convince me of libertarianism when I read him. I said, Nozick is Robert Nozick is now considered um, uh, maybe part of the mainstream. He's, I know he's studied in in colleges. I mean, he's he's certainly gotten gotten widespread acceptance. Well, part of it, he was a very brilliant man, and he wrote books that weren't about libertarianism. He wrote too. in the seventies, right? Well, his book. Uh, Anarchy Student Utopia, I believe it was 1974, and, uh, and, and achieved the National Book Award. So it got immediate attention. It was recognized as a very interesting book, and it certainly is an interesting book. Uh, it has three parts, Anarchy, State, Utopia. And the Anarchy part is where uh, Nozick discusses uh, or argues against a particular kind of anarchism that believed in private property and the rule of law, which is an anarchism that, having read... Uh, Proudhon and Bakunin and Kropotkin, I was entirely unfamiliar with. Uh, so these anarchists were very, very different creatures than I'd ever come across before. And they believed in private property, which was the part of anarchism that seemed kind of attractive to me, that there was no private property we all shared and shared alike, or, you know, there was no big, huge tracts of land, you know, there was no rich rich and poor. How, just... how, back, how far back does libertarian anarchism date? Well... What they call anarchism, and I don't think it's a very good term for what they for what they believe. In a sense, it goes back to 1850, 
1849, when Gustave de Molinari, a French econ- a Belgian economist of the French Harmony School, um, wrote a book called, uh, write an essay called The Production of Security, in which he argued quite reasonably that if monopolies are so bad in so many areas of life, government monopolies actually make it harder for consumers and give some people an advantage over others. If that's what good monopolies do, and every good economist of the day believes that, pretty much, uh, then why are we arguing for a monopoly of security? Well, anyway, you hadn't heard about these. No, I hadn't heard about that at all. And I must say, I didn't. I wasn't convinced by his argument. His second section, uh, the state, he argued against a maximal state, the modern welfare state, on the grounds of egalitarianism and envy. He used a famous example of Wilt Chamberlain and, and uh, how if you wanted to take from some and give to others, that meant you had to keep in, intervening in the economy all the time and that you had no conception of side constraints. Um, his, so his, the second part, state, was an argument against egalitarianism? It was an argument against all the major moral arguments for a large uh, modern state. He was arguing instead instead for uh, for for, uh, for a limited state, and he thought this was very good. And his arguments against redistributive justice, the, the kind of justice that John Rawls, his uh, Harvard older Harvard uh, philosopher compatriot, uh, argued for on the theory of justice, he was devastating against Rawls. Uh, and I was also very skeptical of. Uh, of justice. Well, what's the crux of his argument against redistributive justice? Well, there's a lot, there's many points, but the main point is that uh, morals, as most of us really know them, are side constraints on action. We're given a lot of freedom, but there are certain things we may not do to each other. And the uh, construction of a modern state requires a completely different view of justice, one that always interferes and basically erodes freedom at every step of the game. And so that you can't pretend to have a free society when you have a welfare state. You are instead have a very intrusive government that is actually in practice quite tyrannical. And and, and it's not about constraints then, it's about a pattern theory of justice. It's to make fairness for all. And he was, I think it was, no one completely convinced me. I was completely convinced of that position. Uh, I found that the arguments for uh, an extensive state to be moronic. Writing in the 70s, this would have been highly controversial. It was highly controversial. And then his third section was the part that I agreed with even the most. Is that basically, it was about utopia. It was about utopian experimentation, what J.S. Mill referred to as experiments on living. And there, he um, he argued basically what we want is a framework for utopia, Nozick argued. And that means not prescribing for any particular set of values, but simply establishing the rules of the game that allows people to achieve different ends. So you could have your Hutterite community, you could have your, you know, Full sex community, you could have your polyamorous, you could and have your, your Christian community, and all, your, everything and your communist possible. community. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. He was all for he, he was all for good socialist experimentation, just as long as it, it obeyed the basic rules of not basically exploiting others in terms of forcing them into a community. He was against forced community, and I thought that position, which is really a classical liberal position, was the, that, that, that a position of the earliest liberals. If I to say. Yes. That was a good way of explaining. That was a good way of explaining what the early liberals were trying to do in the most consistent way, and so I was pretty much convinced of that position by that book. But the libertarian stuff, where the you know where it's where it's when, especially the stuff against the anarchism stuff, um, well, I didn't know enough about it. But also, I have to admit, uh, he talked about rights in a way that I found very peculiar. Uh, the side constraint discussion of rights in the second section made perfect sense to me. But in the first section, he just deposits rights. Uh, everybody has rights, and there are some things no one will do without abridging those rights. It seemed weirdly circular. Uh, it seemed well, to have... Are we still talking about why you became a libertarian, or are we talking about your... Well, we're, about well, well, actually, we're talking about why I wasn't a libertarian after I read that book. Oh, okay. I was actually probably more of just a, a, a more of a skeptical classical liberal after reading that book, and was not very interested in politics. Uh, a few years later, when I was on my own, and after I had worked at a company and, and actually seen the world a little bit, I began to see the efficacy of private property. And also, I, be, I bumped into a lot of leftists who hated the rich they worked for and were just nasty and actually quite ugly about it. 
And these people had no sense of their contribution. And in fact, I learned something even before I read one lick of economics, the idea of the marginal product. The leftists I knew were envious of the rich and they thought they stole, they took, they, they stole money from them or they were uh, lining their, their pockets with their labor. And I thought, and a more absurd argument for a, for a position could not be imagined. Um, and then the Libertarian Party came around. There was a wonderful uh, anti-libertarian piece in the National Review by Ernest von den Haag, which just laid the libertarian, modern libertarian movement and made fun of it at no end and, and, and called it crazy. And, his, you know, and it, was, it was a lot of fun to read. And I thought, well, maybe I should actually read what libertarians are saying. <laughs> and I went to Inquiry Magazine and picked up a copy of Inquiry Magazine and read their responses. And then I sought out the Libertarian Party and talked to libertarians. Who were some time. of the people writing for uh, Inquiry Magazine? Well, David Friedman, I think, was interviewed. Murray Rothbard was writing regularly for them. Jeff Riggenbeck was a, somebody I've always enjoyed there. Well, didn't Chomsky even publish an Inquiry? Yes, and Anthony Burgess. Uh, that was a wonderful magazine. In fact, probably my favorite magazine that's ever existed. What exactly does libertarianism have in common with the left? Well... For one thing, many people on the left, and what I grew up with on the left, are tolerant, socially tolerant people. When I grew up, I hated conservatives, almost instinctively, because they kept on harping about the length of somebody else's hair. Like, why would you care if some guy wears his hair long? But it was really important for the conservatives. Leftists, on the other hand, liberals of various kinds were just more tolerant. And that seemed to be an important part of human morality. Um, it's, at that point, too, weren't there a lot more leftists who were anti-statist? Yeah, well, that's the other point. Is that there, there, there's a well, they were anti-war for one thing. The left became anti-war, perhaps conveniently for some, in the late '60s, uh, and um, and I and that's sort of how you got attached to the left. But when I was living in the city and dealing with all sorts of people, and the left was, you know, the Marxist left was just reprehensibly stupid. I mean, moronically dumb. Uh, that there was no reason to even talk to these people. Uh, it was it was embarrassing, but before then, the left always seemed to have you know be filled with people who were socially tolerant, uh, interested about interested in uh, past achievements of human civilization, which is an important part of also interested efforts. in utopianism, interested in yeah anti status status. We should talk later about when what was the turning point when the left started to mean. Almost unshakable faith in the power of the state. To well, that it. happened in the nineteenth century too. I mean, state socialism was a major position on the left, and state socialism is what basically defined socialism for most people by nineteen hundred. And well, states, how can the left both mean anti-statist and statist? Well, because they because they have some really weird ideas. For one thing, they believe that that the state of the classical liberal period was a construct designed for the very rich and so and they thought of all the wars that the states engaged in were bad because it helped the rich but didn't help the poor so they could be anti-state of their period but they want a state that was for them so everybody wants to have big bully on their side well i did yeah think if you watch the daily show or read the daily costs half the articles are about how wonderful the state is and all it's going to do for us and half the articles are about the outrage is committed by the state on that particular day. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very hard to tell what exactly is your position. <laughs> and, you know, it's left and right don't really mean all that much. However, there is something to it. Uh, I mean, you know, left and right come from the division of the French Assembly. So that's where the terms come from. And the right was the traditionalists who liked the old order, which was, you know, monarchical and clerical and and so forth and they had you know a medieval basically and uh and uh, the left were the people who wanted to break that order up and that included libertarians classical liberals and it included socialists uh, but they had very different ideas over time left and right came to be there's two there's several dimensions on which you i mean left and right is just one dimension right on the left is this on the right's that so on the left you have people who were uh against tradition as a binding force on society and for opening up. I think we need to have a cat that needs to have some attention. Let's see. Left and right, what, what is it? These are polar opposites, you know, or there's there, left is one direction, right's the other direction in a one-dimensional thing, usually as you're going forward. So it's kind of a weird directional thing. 
that we uh, lump political ideologies on, and it well, often makes no sense. Well, it applied to one side of this house and the other side of this Right. House. But it was, you know, it was the, 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 uh, the uh, traditionalists who believed in clericism and monarchical society, excuse me, monarchical society, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and the old order, the ancien regime, which was mercantilist, and heavily state involved in the economy, but to the adv to the advantage of some classes and not others. Uh, and opposing to these were the, the, the new people, uh, the bourgeois and the proletariats. Uh, there was a tendency for the bourgeois to be, uh, the, that is the middle class, the entrepreneurial class, the business class, to be for what we would consider classical liberalism as freedom, free markets, le less protectionist, and so forth. There was a tendency, not, 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 certainly not a class interest, but certainly there was a tendency. And then for the proletariats, to, uh, the people who had less and who were workers, people who lived on a salary or a fixed income of some uh, long-term contract, these people tended to be for uh, socialism. Would, but it they be, were, would it be fair to say that the modern left and right were originally both parts of the left? Uh, and both parts of the right. Uh, there's elements of both. And they switched around quite a bit. There's, there's a lot of muddle in this. Uh, because whereas tradition versus radical reform and opening up, you know, openness versus, you know, constraining tradition, you know, constraining tradition is right and, and opening things up is left. That's that's just one, one idea. Tolerance is considered left and liberal, and it was, it was the 19th century, and conservatives were considered, you know, constrained and puritanical and moralistic and, and wanted to run your life. That's just the way it was. Uh, as time grew on in the 19th century... And well, class almost immediately, the, the left, the French left, proved itself as murderous and tyrannical as the right of Yeah, of course, but they were murderous more than... I mean, the, 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 the conservatives weren't exactly so much murderous as just wanting to be constricting. And, and, uh, well, well, I mean, with show trials and wanting to control the behavior, the left almost immediately showed itself, at least in France. Yes, France was ugly. It was a very ugly situation. And uh, they couldn't figure a way out of the box they were in. And uh, and they only did it through a horrible, horrible revolution and a, and a totalitarian state, and that set up the and that set up much of what became socialism. I mean, much of Rousseau was heavily uh, in was a huge influence on on the French Revolution, and people associated Rousseau the Rousseauvian uh, primitivism, which was romantic, and socialism, which was romantic, with this tyrannical state, and they... Well, I should say for younger listeners, too, that the thing I'm referring to is the, is the, the red... What, what was it called? The red terror? No, the terror. The terror. The terror, where they were chopping the heads off right and left of yeah. of everyone with the guillotine. It was the birth yeah. of the guillotine. Yeah. Anybody who deviated from the what? The, <laughs> well, it was mainly the, the... party line. It started with arist the aristocrats, mainly. Yeah. <laughs> but pretty soon they were slaughtering one another because they right. were deviating from... Right. From... So it very quickly turned ugly. Was it inherent in what they were preaching, or was there something else going on? Well, it's very dangerous when you choose totalitarian means, because then all of a sudden your ends become tyrannical as well. Uh, and that's something that I think that leftists should be very concerned about. And sometimes they have remained concerned. However, the left has also been anti-private property for a long time, and the right was sort of for private property. And as classical liberalism... For property remaining in the hands of of the, the elite. Well, at first of the elite, but then as the 19th century progressed and classical liberalism liberalism became ascendant and free markets, anti-protectionism, uh, the rule of law in a classically liberal sense and individualism became sort of a major key by 1850. This was a, 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 a certainly in Britain and also in America to some degree, and also in many parts of Europe, this was a major social force and a political development of major importance. And so what became the right is that what used to be arguing for you know, the old tradition, they became arguing against the socialists for private property. And so one of the dimensions on which left and right are considered is anti-private property and for private private property. And so the right is a, a, a private property thing and the left is anti-private property thing. And on that ground, of course, a libertarian is adamantly opposed to the left because the left, of course, 
comes up with these ideas of common property that turn out to require for workability a totalitarian system. Yes. And, and the leftists to this day have a real difficulty with that. They don't really understand. Uh, they don't really understand just how totalitarian they are. And they are blithely unaware of how tyrannical they have become. Well, the, the terror was almost a, a foreshadowing yes. of everything that the left would do in the next century or so. Yeah, it foreshadowed the Russian Revolution, surely. And it foreshadows even now the willingness of leftists to just throw people under the bus because, oh, they, well, they just do, you know, they're disobeying the law. The law says that you can't, you know, uh, sell tuna without a special, you know, insignia on it from, you know, and just, they just go on and on and they just blindly throw people in prison uh, or, or take away well, all right the prison. Right, too. They'll throw people in prison for smoking a plant. Yeah, but that's also a left thing, too. The uh, left and the right are both very, very. That's another problem is, of course, there's also in there's many dimensions to left and right. And many times what we call left and right share the same same values because they're all trying to most of the time left and right have particular values and particular visions of the world. They're trying to shove down other people's throats, whereas the classical liberal and libertarian idea is that we're not trying to shove particular values. We're trying to establish the moral side constraints upon which civilization rests and which we can live together in peace and with voluntary cooperation set up the societies we want.